Hello and welcome to CMC Markets and this Monday market update dated the 13th of February 2017. My name is Michael Hewson and I will be taking you through a quick uh, overview of this week's key events from my point of view. But before I get started, I have to display the obligatory risk warning, um, which uh, I have to show before every one of these particular every one of these particular events and uh, then we can pretty much crack on and get started so just uh, digest that for a few seconds and then we can then we can really get into the uh, get into the guts of uh, what I'm looking at um, this week first and foremost got off to a bit of a slow start today markets are slightly positive certainly the FTSE 100 um, continues to edge ever so slightly higher slightly better performance out of the German DAX and the CAC Caront um, but once again we've got geopolitical concerns I think in Europe weighing on equity markets in Europe more probably more so than say for example the FTSE 250 which is once again making new record highs the FTSE 100 which is lagging a little bit behind but it's being supported by a significant rebound in commodity prices iron ore prices now up around about $86 a ton copper prices have broken out of a key resistance level on the top side as well as the 200 week moving average and that's the first time copper prices have traded above the 200 week moving average since February 2013 and you know some people have sort of decried the 200 week moving average as being not particularly important in the context of the overall scheme of things but ultimately the reason it's so important I think is because of the fact that it's also coincided with a significant breakout to the top side from the previous highs that we saw not only in 2016 but which has also capped the, the move higher in the price of copper throughout most of the first part of this year so if you look at it in the context of this move here which I've drawn out on this rectangular consolidation on the copper prices that we've been in since pretty much um, the middle of November we've traded between the highs of 273 243 so in a bit of, you know in a in a fairly decent range over the course of the past few months we've broken out of that range and we broke out of that range on Friday so that combined with a significant break higher in um, through the 200 week moving average I think gives added weight to the breakout so you know we, we we can talk about moving average breakouts but also I think they need to be used in conjunction with a breakout of a significant resistance level and here we have that we have that it's fairly unequivocal you've got one two three four and in the five and the break now what we need to see here is if we take this move here and project it higher then potentially we're looking at a test of the three the 300 level or the three dollars three the three dollar mark which was basically up where this moving ever where this resistance line is from the highs that we've seen from the peaks in 2011 so it's you know this this move higher in copper prices is important in the context of the overall break of the previous peaks and the breakout of this consolidation that we've been in over the course of the past three to four months so I can certainly see potential for us to move back to this trend line here back up towards 300 what mustn't happen for this to unfold is we mustn't move back below this resistance level this pre previous resistance level and the 200 week moving average so I talked about this a little bit in my video last week on Thursday I talked about the fact that we were pushing up against this really key resistance level I also talked about the move lower in oil prices and the fact that we were looking potentially to look for a retest lower now that didn't happen now why didn't that happen we saw some significant builds in crude oil inventories but nonetheless we weren't able to sustain that move lower I think whatever the reasons were for that the fact that we didn't break out of this key support level here was a significant um, was a significant factor in that I talked about the fact that we broke low we we traded lower two days in a row 
in a similar way that we traded very sharply lower of these two days here. We weren't able to take out these lows. But what's more important here is that we actually haven't broken out of the range that we've been in since the beginning of December. And that for me I think is important as well. We've seen these OPEC cuts, we've seen 90% compliance, we've seen Saudi Arabia potentially cut the most, but ultimately what we haven't seen as yet is a break of the highs that we've seen throughout December and the beginning of January, which really pretty much keeps us within the overall range. And I think that's important in the context of where we go to next, because ultimately people talk about higher oil prices, they talk about lower oil prices. Ultimately, markets generally tend to range around about 70% of the time. The other 30% of the time, they generally tend to trend. And ultimately, what we're seeing at the moment with respect to crude oil prices is we're in a range-bound market. And until such times as we've seen some significant evidence of a breakout of that range, that's really the way you should be looking to trade it trade the overall range as opposed to trying to preempt a potential breakout simply because the law of averages dictates that that's generally what markets tend to do until we get a breakout you then have a tight stop loss it minimizes your potential losses if and when the market does break out which it will do eventually the big unknown at the moment is which way we will go so uh, and ultimately I don't even have the answer to that particular question we did break below the 50 day moving average on WTI but we didn't get a similar confirmation on Brent and those of you who listened regularly regularly to my webinars will always say that I usually want to see confirmation of a trend breakout or a moving average breakout on both contracts given how closely correlated Brent and WTI are WTIR. We did see WTI break lower or close below the 50 day moving average but that wasn't confirmed by a similar close lower on WTI. So again it's really a question of we're still in the range ultimately you know while we're below the peaks that we saw in December and January I think that's probably going to be the continue to be or continue to be the way of it for Brent crude prices. What it what there are a number of other factors at play here and I think obviously that's why equity markets are doing as well as they are. We've seen Chinese economic data continue to come in slightly better than expected. On Friday Chinese trade data showed a significant improvement not only in the export outlook but we saw a significant improvement also in imports as well and that would appear to suggest that demand is picking up certainly in the commodity space we've seen um, significant imports not only in oil prices but also in copper prices and in iron ore prices and also in rubber prices as well um, in China. Some of that, that import data showed a significant pickup in demand for all of those key commodities and I think that's generally why you're seeing a significant push higher in US markets in particular, probably European markets less so because of the risk profile in terms of European equities, concerns about political constraints or political um, political fallout from the as yet unresolved Greek crisis. Obviously the Italian banking crisis is, an, uh, is a clear and present danger and as yet it still remains unresolved. Obviously we also have the French elections which are a, consider a considerable concern as well given the fact that Marine Le Pen is likely to win the first round she probably won't win the second round but ultimately I think it's keeping investors slightly on the back foot given the significant divergence that we're seeing particularly in French bonds as, as a result of concern about the political outlook in France so um, <coughs> I've just been asked about the CAC current euro yen euro dollar dollar CAD Aussie dollar dollar yen more than happy to go through that and we'll be going through that as we progress this particular webinar but I think what we want to keep an eye out for this week is inflation data because we've got a whole host of inflation data coming out from not only China but also Germany the UK and the US and the likelihood is that we're going to see significant rise in inflationary pressure and a large part of that will be predicated on the rebound that we've seen in energy prices over the course of the last 12 months this time last year 
Crude oil prices were trading between $27 and $32 a barrel. Well, we're significantly higher than that now. That is going to filter through into the mainstream CPI numbers that we're due to get out of China, the UK and Germany tomorrow. And obviously, if those numbers come out much, much higher than expected, and certainly there is an expectation that they will, then ultimately that's going to prompt further concerns about tighter monetary policy, not only from the Bank of England, given Kristen Forbes' comments last week about the fact that her tolerance for higher inflation will start to bump up against the limits of what she considers safe. Now, Kristen Forbes will be leaving the MPC at the end of June so ultimately what she thinks about inflation is tempered somewhat by the fact that she is a minority on the MPC but ultimately um, if she gets support for that particular stance from Mr McCafferty who also voted against QE in August then I think the debate could start to generate an awful lot of mileage and could well help support the pound which continues to remain fairly resilient in the face of the triggering or the potential triggering of article 50 which is due to come or which is due to take place next month but let's look at the headline inflation numbers for China. Chinese inflation has risen, particularly factory gate inflation, which I think will be the key driver and will start to trickle down over the course of the next few months. It's risen from minus 0.8 in August last year and is likely to come in at 6.6% um, for January um, when the figures are released tomorrow. UK inflation is due to come in at 1.9%, CPI, head, uh, headline CPI, 1.9%. That was at the beginning of J January last year, it was at 0.3%. So there's a massive increase and it was 0.6% in August of last year. So we've seen significant rebound there. We've also seen, we're also expecting to see German CPI come in at 1.9% for January and that's from minus 0.1% in April last year and Germany in particular is concerned about the impact of negative rates on its savers given that they're minus 0.4 and inflation is running at almost 2%. So let's start with euro dollar. Start with euro dollar because I think for me this is the key this, this is one of the key what reasons why euro dollar hasn't come off as quickly as I suspect it should do given the concerns about political instability in the euro area. Now the 50 day moving average is acting as a little bit of support. Now you can argue as to whether or not that's a red herring. Let's look at how it's reacted over the course of the last six months. It has acted as resistance. Okay we had a bit of a spike through there but it's acted as resistance through there. Now acting as support but I think more importantly with respect to euro dollar is this level through here and it's around about the 106 area, 105, 80, 90. Also coincides with the 50 day moving average as well. If we look at the 50 day moving average, the value of that, um, we can see that from the, the value window there. If we just hold that still, it should give us the value. It's, it's around about 106, 105, 90. That can be, that can be, quickly, um, that can be quickly activated from there. So do that again. There we go, right in the corner on there. So the 106 level on the left hand side over here, key support I think on Euro dollar, also coincides with these series of lows through here. Um, and it really sort of, I think it really sort of boils down to what your feelings are on the strength of the dollar because also what's we're going to be keeping a particular eye on tomorrow and Wednesday is Janet Yellen's testimony, chairman of the Fed, chairwoman of the Fed. She will be testifying on Capitol Hill in Washington to um, the House of Representatives, the Senate Banking Committee on Tuesday, but also the House Financial Services Committee on Wednesday. And part of that testimony will be how she views the US economy. She's going to face a number of questions on rates the path of interest rates and fiscal reform or fiscal policy and potential reform to the Dodd-Frank Act that um, President Trump has signified that he wants to make significant changes to. I've also been asked about gold and silver, yet more than happy to do that. Um, I, will, I will certainly come on to that in the course of the next 15 minutes.
so so looking looking at the dollar and I think this is once again let's look at the dollar index because I think that's going to be particularly important I talked about this last week that key support level just below 100 so far managed to hold now can we see further gains in the dollar well certainly I think we're finding a little bit of resistance um, just above current levels through here I don't know if I just latch that on there. It's around about 101120. 10, can we go a little bit higher? Potentially we can. We can come back to this potential left shoulder up here, which is around about 102, because if this is an irregular head and shoulders top, then ultimately we we have poten we have potential to go a little bit higher in the short to medium term. But it is finding a little bit of resistance just above current levels around about 10120, which sort of also feeds into the narrative of a little bit of a little bit of support on euro dollar so looking at euro dollar but also if we look at sterling dollar we've we found a, another area of support again with the 50 day moving average now we would have got caught a little bit when we broke below 124 last week when we went down all the way down to 12350 now that was that was a classic bear trap there it would have caught most people out it caught me out but nonetheless, I still remain fairly bullish on the pound against the dollar for no other reason than the fact that I think an awful lot of the worst news with respect to cable is priced in. And I think ultimately, given the way these moving averages are starting to converge, yes, the 100-day moving average is still pointing down. For me, the key level is this series of lows through here. One, two, three, four. Yeah, we did get a little bit of a spike down yesterday. That was reversed quite quickly from those hawkish comments from Kristen Forbes, which has certainly helped, I think, in the overall scheme of things. We didn't stay down there very long. We stayed down there about eight hours. We've now managed to hold above this key level around about 124.20, 124.30. And while we do so, I'm still of the opinion that we've got potential to move back to these highs that we saw at the end of January. We had a very dovish quarterly inflation report. I think the Bank of England is still very reluctant to admit it made a mistake in cutting rates in August. And ultimately, I think the data is going to prove, continue to improve, continue to prove that it was a mis mistake to cut rates. And that then feeds into the narrative of obviously Wednesday's data when we get average earnings data which again I think is likely to continue to show that wage growth remains fairly resilient against a backdrop of a fairly tight labour market. Unemployment I think is going to continue to remain around about the 4.8-4.9 percent level. Wage growth is going to still continue to be in the region of around about 2.83 percent and while that is in line with retail prices which are around about 2.7 percent it's still below CPI even though the gap is continuing to narrow. Inflation wages are still rising ahead of inflation um, and have continued to do so since 2014. So while that gap continues to remain positive in terms of wages, I would expect the pound to continue to remain fairly well supported. So 124 on the downside, if, if we do break lower and we're able to consolidate the move lower, then obviously there is potential for us to go back to 122.50, but on the basis of what we've seen over the past week or so, I think there is steady. I think there's steady interest to buy the pound, particularly against the dollar around about 124. One of the reasons why I'm probably more bullish on the pound than I am is is euro sterling. Euro sterling is continuing to find it very very difficult to rally. Um, we can certainly look at it in the context of these moves here. Now this chart does look a little bit cluttered and I apologise for that. So let's just remove the line so you can get a better idea of where we are. Um, good support around about these sorts of lows through here but also you've got trendline support coming in there. But again, you know, I've talked about this at length over the course of the past few weeks. I think we are building up a top in Euro Sterling. It looks like a head and shoulders reversal. Ultimately, it could take a while to pan out, but ultimately I feel more comfortable selling rallies in Euro Sterling than, than I do buying Euro Sterling. And I think that for me, I think is important. But we do have a significant area of support around about 84.70, 84.80. But if we look at the distribution of these particular candles through here, in particular, around about 
um, the, these these peaks from Wednesday the 8th, there is a significant resistance around 80, 85, 85, 50, 85, 70, 80. I've talked about it on the chart forums here. While we hold below the 85, 70, 80 area, the bias remains for a move back towards the 84, 70 area and potentially lower. Now, obviously, if we move back above that 85, 80 area, then the previous peaks come back into play. But again, here, there's significant resistance around 86.50, 86.60. So ultimately, I still favour of I still favour a policy with respect to euro sterling uh, of buying, buying sterling, buying sterling on dips, and that will remain m my raison d'être, if you like, for euro sterling until such times as I'm convinced that that momentum has changed. Okay, so let's quickly look at um, euro yen. Talks talked about. I haven't looked at dollar yen yet. I will do. Euro yen is probably much more problematic because you've got basically two weaker currents, two fairly weak currencies, and two central banks that are adopting a weak monetary policy. Whereas when you're comparing, say, for example, the Bank of England and the euro, or the Bank of England and the yen, it's sl it's slightly less, it's slightly more cut and dried. And ultimately, I don't think there is any scope for the Bank of England to cut rates further. Whereas the ECB might feel compelled to keep policy looser for longer, but I don't think they're going to be looking to cut cut rates anytime soon because of um, the interest rate, because of the, because of the rate of inflation at the moment. But ultimately, eurozone inflation is much weaker than it is in the UK, simply because the weaker nations are holding, say, for example, countries like Germany back. So euro yen is slightly more problematic in terms of where it goes to next. But certainly, I think in the context of where we are, it's trading pretty much sideways in a corridor between the lows that we saw around about 119 and the resistance level that we've seen um, at, um, at the end of January around about 123, 122 and a half. So for me, euro yen is not really that conclusive. Dollar yen, on the other hand, does t is does appear to be trading in a bit of a sideways range. There's solid support down here at around about 111.60. I still think there's significant resistance around 114.30, and I've talked about the dollar yen in the context of my chart forum comments here. 114.30. I think we need to get back above 114.30 to signal a retest of the uh, of of these particular levels here. At around about 115, 11480, you've got a series of highs through here, and at the moment, what these candles here are telling me is that there is a significant amount of indecision between buyers and sellers to to suggest that while the bias is probably to the upside because of the significant the significant aggregation of lows around about here I think we're in a range for dollar yen and the on the and the dollar yen on the wide of it I think is going to be 110 115 because ultimately I think that's probably the optimal price or the optimal range for Shinzo Abe and Donald Trump because Donald Trump doesn't want too strong a dollar Bank of Japan doesn't want too weak a yen to invite criticism from the new US president. So 110, 115 is probably the optimal range for dollar yen, politics notwithstanding, for, um, you know, for, 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 I think, for the status quo to be maintained. So that's why I think euro yen is going to be a little bit problematic in the context of where it goes to next. Euro dollars in a bit of a range, dollar yen's in a bit of a range, thus euro yen is in a little bit of a range. So Looking at Aussie dollar, it's not really that much different from last week. We're pushing up against a significant resistance level from the peaks that we saw in 2015. And while we do so, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to really buy Aussie at these sorts of levels. We're pushing up against resistance from the trend line resistance 2015 highs, but also we've got the 2016 peaks all the way through here. That suggests to me that irrespective of the strength in commodity prices, which has helped push the Aussie up, we haven't seen the Aussie really push back through the 77 level and the 77.50 level. And I think the Reserve Bank of Australia is going to be very uncomfortable with the Aussie much above the levels that we've seen at the end of last year 
and obviously the resistance that we're seeing and pushing against over the course of the last few weeks. So for Aussie dollar, I think we're at, we're at the top end of the recent range. It's going to struggle to really push much above 77. And as such, I think the bias is for us to probably drift back down towards 76 and 75 over the course of the next few trading sessions. Looking at dollar CAD, again, it's a much, very much a play on the oil price. And looking at this four hour chart, we can see, we can see it here definite downtrend in place certainly with respect to dollar cad we could probably push back to around about 131.50 um, 131.60 but overall I don't expect it to have the momentum to push significantly higher uh, and unless there is a significant sell-off in the oil price now the oil price could push dollar cad up towards the top of this line but ultimately big big support around about 130 and I think that's probably I think that's probably the way of it over the course of the next tr next few trading sessions. Brings me on to gold prices because gold prices, I think, we we found a bit of support around about 12.20. What does worry me about gold, though, and it's this little candle here. It's a key reversal day, which would appear to suggest that unless we can get back above this 1235 area then we could be then we could be gearing up for a retest of 1220 and potential test of the 1200 level um, which we saw in the middle of January this, this sort of candle formation it's not it's not doesn't always work but it does give me a little bit of pause because ultimately what it can do is signal a little bit of a sideways or a downward correction before we start to move higher again. I mean, the trend in gold prices is higher. There's no, there's no disputing that. Certainly what we've seen since the end of December uh, reflects that, but it also reflects the weakness in the US dollar. And I think a lot of the where gold goes to next will be determined by how dovish Janet Yellen sounds when she testifies on Capitol Hill tomorrow. And I think what we should pay particular attention to tomorrow is Janet Yellen's views on the US labor market, how much slack she still considers there is in the US economy, and whether she's worried about the significant decline that we saw in wages growth in the last non-farm payrolls number. That non-farm payrolls number was particularly good at 246,000. What was what surprised me a little bit was 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 how the dollar reacted to that. And I think the reason the dollar reacted the way that it did was because of the weak wage growth. Certainly if we look at the way the markets are pricing in the prospects of a March rate rise, they're only pricing in a 30% probability of a hike. Now that could change tomorrow, particularly if Janet Yellen is at pains to keep the prospect of a rate hike on the table. And I, and I don't think she's going to take it off the table, but certainly her vice chair, Stanley Fisher, has suggested there's still a significant amount of uncertainty about Donald Trump's tax plans. Now he's talked about the prospect of something phenomenal and big league in the next two or three weeks. But ultimately, in the next two or three weeks, it's going to be very, very difficult to really formulate a plan, push it through Congress, get congressional approval for it, um, to get a clear idea of the effect it will have on the US economy. And for that reason, and I think for that reason alone, I think it's going to be highly unlikely that the Fed will move on the 15th of March. I think it's just too soon. We talk about the potential for three rate hikes this year. If they're going to go for three rate hikes this year, then I think they really would have to move in March. Now, you could argue that they could go in June, September and December, and that's quite possible. But certainly on the basis of this here, at the moment the markets aren't pricing in the potential for a move in March. Now that could change. That could change if tomorrow's, oh sorry, this week's US CPI numbers come out much hotter than expected. And certainly on Wednesday, US CPI is expected to jump from 2.1% 
to 2.4 but then again so is Chinese CPI German and UK CPI is expected to jump to 1.9 percent so US CPI jumping on its own is not enough to drive the dollar higher particularly if other countries inflation data always jumps also jumps as well because you're talking about the differential between the, the between the two yield curves so it's also a compare and a, it's also a compare and a contrast so um, in the context of the differentials that will be ultimately what drives the move higher or lower in the currency markets so gold prices I'm a little bit concerned that we may be due a little bit of a correction lower but only if we can't get back above 1235 if we break below 1220 then I think we could go for a little run down to the 1200 level where I think we should find some you know fairly decent buying interest in the short to medium term silver prices I hate silver because it's just so volatile but ultimately what we've got here again a nice little uptrend in place but what distorts the silver market is the fact that it's also an it's used for industrial purposes so as such it's not such a good proxy for say for, it's not such a good proxy for central bank um, policy than say for example gold is certainly this breakout here does suggest that silver prices have got potential to go back to $19 an ounce why because this is a potential reversal here through here you've got this break of you've got this break of resistance through here at 17 17 10 that for me I think is significantly bullish and ultimately I think given that breakout the potential for a move higher is probably higher in silver prices but that's not to say that we can't have a little bit of a pullback in the short to medium term back to this trend line through here but certainly the break of the 200 day moving average if we can consolidate this move through 18 then I think there's potential for us to go back to 19 but I would probably wait for a bit of a pullback first than than piling into this particular trade here because this break of the 200 day moving average for me is not conclusive enough and also the oscillator is looking fairly overbought so and it's finding a little bit of a struggle to get through this $18 an ounce level which also happened to coincide with a little bit of support down through here so keep an eye on that $18 an ounce a little bit sticky around there could prompt a little bit of a pullback towards this trend line support here but I am encouraged by the fact that we've broken through this $17 area through here just get rid of one of them get rid of a couple of them redraw that through there there we go okay so this breakthrough here I'm encouraged by the fact that we have broken higher but we could go for a little bit of a pause here drift back and then go again okay so is there anything that I haven't covered thus far ladies and gents that you want me to um, expand upon because otherwise I'm going to wrap this up I think I've pretty much covered everything that I needed to cover um, unless anyone has any questions um, I will uh, I'll uh, wrap this week's uh, this uh, session up I will obviously post this on YouTube um, in the next couple of hours if anyone wants to sort of listen back to any of the points that I've covered but ultimately I'd like to say thanks very much for uh, uh, listening and I'll speak to you all uh, same time same place next Monday